All right, folks. So we have been covering Revelation. We're now to chapter four. So yes, chapter four. And we were getting through verse one. And we had talked about these 24 elders and who they could represent. We're going to talk some more about them as well today. But essentially, these 24 elders, which are actually later on in chapter four, a few verses ahead, we're talking about why is it that we see them in this vision of the throne of God? Now, at some point, maybe by the time we end chapter four, we'll review the different visions of the throne of God. And we're going to see a lot of similarities in every vision. But the only thing that's different in John's vision than all the other visions is these 24 elders, these people who were not previously there. And they happened again after the close of the churches, after we read those things that are in chapter two and chapter three of Revelation. Now, last time we left off where we talked about how the churches, the overcomers, particularly from the church of Philadelphia, they were promised they were going to escape. They were going to be kept from the hour of temptation that came on the whole world. But then we read in the book of Revelation, the saints who are on the world, in the world during the opening of the seals, they are not kept from the hour. Matter of fact, they're overcome. They suffer. They're beheaded. They're killed. And that just doesn't line up to what the overcomers are promised in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. So we're now going to consider some more information that we have about the rapture. So we're going to review this kind of just to see what the basic gist of the rapture is. So the first thing we know is that we are all changed in an instant. We are instantly transformed. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. What is the twinkling of an eye? That's the time it takes light to reflect off the eye, right? Just that little sparkle of someone's eyes as they're turning and the light's flashing across it. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So that's the first thing. It's a very quick and an instantaneous change. The return of Christ. The second thing is the return of Christ for the church in the rapture is something that the church is to always be ready for. There's nothing that can precede it. It can happen at any time. We are to expect Jesus' return at any moment, unlike the second coming, which has a large number of clear signs that must happen before it, right? Now, there's a lot of people who don't believe in this doctrine. The doctrine is called the doctrine of imminency. That means that the return of Christ is imminent. It can happen at any moment. So let's just look through the Bible and see how soon did the apostles expect Jesus to return? When did they expect it? right? Were they waiting for all of these wars and Gog invading and all these other things? Well, they seem to expect it in John's lifetime, did they not? In John chapter 21, verse 22 and 23, this is after the resurrection, Jesus was talking and Peter was like, hey, uh, you know, he's talking to Jesus and Jesus is telling Peter how he's going to die. And Peter's like, well, that's great. What about this guy? He points at John, right? And we read in John 21, verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow me. Follow thou me. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren. All the early church believed it, right? The saying went abroad among the brethren that this disciple should not die. Yet Jesus did not say, said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will, if he will tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So they thought that John was going to survive until the return of Christ. Incorrectly, right? But that was their expectation. You see how they kind of seemed it could happen, certainly within John's lifetime, maybe not within Peter's. He already got the bad news. But, you know, John was expected to live to then. Paul, the apostle who wrote much of our New Testament, he seemed to think it could happen at any moment and was even sooner than he had first thought. So in Romans 13, 11, and 12, he says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. For the night is far spent, the day is at hand. The night's almost over, guys. It's almost dawn, right? He's coming. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So Paul expected the rapture and the glorification 
of the bodies of the saints. Again, our spirits are glorified the moment we accept Christ, but our bodies will be glorified at the rapture. And he expected it at any moment. And he preached the same in his letters to the churches. He argued that we have to always be ready for it, even from the very first churches. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, we read, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are you looking? You're looking to heaven. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So he's saying that we need to be looking to heaven where Jesus is going to come and change our bodies. When does that happen again? At the rapture, right? So we then he then teaches that the next thing after salvation, what is the next step? Is to do good works and to constantly be fixated on the return of Christ. That's what the church is called to do. So in uh, first, excuse me, in Titus chapter two, verse 12, he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, anybody who says Jesus is not God clearly disagrees with Paul, right? So we're looking for the appearing of God who is the appearing of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what the church is supposed to be doing, constantly looking for the return of Christ. Wait a minute, why am I not looking for the abomination of desolation? Because there's clearly a rapture that has no prerequisites. It could happen at any moment. The author of Hebrews, who I believe to, I believe to be Paul, he expected the next appearance of Jesus Christ to be only to those who look for him, not for everyone in the world. His next appearing are to those that look for him. So in Hebrews 9.28, it says, So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So there are those who are looking for Christ. Tell me, who is looking for Christ today? We are, exactly. It's certainly those who have accepted him as Savior. The rest of the world, are they looking for Christ? Is that the next thing on their agenda? Certainly not, right? Jesus himself says what? He says he's coming soon. Revelation 22, 20. He that testifieth, these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? So the rapture is something the church was to expect. It was the next thing on their timeline. And until it happens, we're to do good works. We're to serve him because of our salvation. So what happens after the rapture, once the church is in heaven? From what we can tell, again, there are some people that debate this and disagree about this. This seems to be for the church where the judgment seat of Christ takes place. Some people call it the Bema seat, right? The Bible is clear that every single one of us is going to stand before God in judgment. And because of that, we should be careful how we judge one another. So in Romans 14, verse 10 through 12, he says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Why are you disregarding your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So that then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So it's really interesting how they're all going to bow before Christ. And again, he's, you see where he just uses Christ and God interchangeably. It's all over the Bible. I know so many people want to say, no, Jesus is not God. No, he's absolutely God. If you believe your Bible, you cannot deny that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. Now, to be clear, the judgment seat of Christ is not judgment day. It's not the great white throne judgment, okay? That is where your determination, the great white throne, is where your eternal destination is determined. And the church does not stand trial there. It is reserved for the unsaved who want to they get exactly what they wanted. They want to be judged based on their own righteousness, and they want to pit it up against the righteousness of God to see if they measure up. Spoiler alert, they don't. They do not measure up. So in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 12, we read about it. He says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it 
from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. I mean, think about the power in our God. And that's why I think people are so foolish to take it lightly when they pray. Even some Christians I've seen just pray in a manner that's in some ways disrespectful. I think God loves us like a father loves a child, right? But that doesn't mean I don't respect my father. Even if I talk to him affectionately, it's done with respect. And it says in verse 12 of Revelation 20, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Praise God, I will never be judged according to my works. Because I would be toast. I'm judged according to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you've accepted him, that's true for every one of you. And if you've not accepted him, you got bigger problems than when the rapture is. You really got to get right with God. So again, how do we know this isn't for the church? Because it's a judgment of their works that determines their eternal destiny. But for the church, when we go before the judgment seat of Christ, it is a reward regarding our works. It has to do with rewards for the works we did that were pleasing to God, that were honoring to God, and a burning up and a loss for the works we did that were for ourselves, right? Um, so in uh, Revelation, uh, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, uh, actually, wait, let me, before I go there, look at Revelation uh, 20, verse 13 through 15. It says that this has to do with the works that the people did that pitted themselves against God. They're going to be cast into a lake of fire. And that's where death and hell come to an end as well. Once that judgment day happens, there is no more room for sin and its consequence, death, right? In Revelation 20, 13, it says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, again, according to their works, right? And 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I would tell you that from my understanding here and from the words written here, everyone that stands before the great white throne judgment is going to be found guilty. Why? Again, because they're being judged by their own works. The Bible has already answered that for us. There is none righteous. No, not one. Only through Christ can you avoid that judgment seat, right? The judgment of the church is going to, again, determine the rewards, what you've earned because you are saved, the work you've done for your Lord and Savior. And we know, again, that we're not going to be judged for our works in the sense of hell or heaven or like a fire in heaven, but rather we're going to see the rewards because we've worked for God. And that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. It says, wherefore we labor, we work, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We want Jesus to be pleased with us, right? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Christians absolutely can still do bad, and absolutely we can do good in faith to God. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we're not scared he's going to send us to hell, but we know that everything we do has consequences, right? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God. It's all laid out before God. And I trust also that you are made also are made manifest in your consciousness. Consciences, excuse me. So all the works we do in this world are going to either be a permanent reward or a temporary waste of time. Okay? That's our works. The choice is ours. But the most important thing before we decide whether we're good or bad is do we have that rock solid foundation of salvation. That is the most important thing. Do you stand on Christ? And once you stand on Christ, your salvation is secure. And that takes us back to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. It says, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, you have to be on that foundation. You're going to put on gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. 
Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide gold, silver, precious stones, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work, again, the Bible already told us this is bad work. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I mean, there's eternal security written all over this, right? So the fire is either going to destroy your wasted life, your useless works, but if you're saved, you're saved. Or it can refine your good works, making them even more valuable. If I gave you a pound of gold and it was, you know, 70% pure, by making, by burning it away, I will actually make it 100% pure, making it more valuable to someone who's going to buy it, right? But a lot of people, they're going to be sadly surprised. I know a lot of Christians say, oh, well, I'm saved. That's good enough. I've done enough. I don't need to do anything else. I've already accepted Jesus. They're going to be surprised to find all their works burned away. And they're going to find out they, did, they didn't earn an ounce of reward. Jesus told us, put your treasures in heaven, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. But they're going to find out that they just wasted this life. So rewards, what are the rewards in heaven? I mean, again, there's a whole lot we can review whenever we do our first Corinthian study. But the idea is that there are crowns. There seems to be positions of authority throughout eternity, right? And who knows? I don't know what the... Uh, uh, the, the commerce or what the uh, monetary exchange you might think of it in eternity is going to be. We don't know what holds value, but we do know that there is a difference in position in eternity, right? There is something where we get rewarded and it's not just a, hey, good job. We're supposed to be storing up treasures in heaven, meaning more than one. And, and the slightest thing you do in the name of Christ, even a cup of water in his name will have a reward. That's a promise of Jesus. So when you go in the morning, when you go here from here today, do things in the name of Jesus. Don't, don't let an opportunity go by. Going to Walmart is many opportunities to do something in the name of Jesus. Show love to the world. Give a track. Tell somebody. Lift someone up. Encourage someone. Pray for someone. Take your time to love others. Show the love of Christ, right? So we see that Essentially, the judgment seat of Christ is what awaits the church after the rapture, right? The next step after the judgment seat of Christ is the marriage of the Lamb, okay? And that's going to be talked about a whole lot more when we get to Revelation 19. We talked a little bit about the ancient Jewish customs for marriage last time. And obviously, there's a lot of pictures in there of Jesus Christ and the church. Um, so the Lamb, what is it? Yeah, so we have the rapture, we have the judgment seat of Christ, and then we have the marriage of the Lamb, right? So, good. I tend to think that the uh, judgment of Christ is like a crimson of the bride. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the mission, yeah. She goes through, right. The night of the mission. Mm -hmm. I kind of see that. That's for us. Yeah, yeah and it goes right along with the way that the, the wedding is set up. So the next thing, though, we see the Lamb sitting on the throne, and the works of the saints that have now been refined through the judgment seat of Christ, right? And it's only made possible by Jesus. We then see by Revelation 19, the bride, and we see that she is wearing white. And what does it say the white is? In Revelation 19, 8, it reads, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. It was granted. The righteousness was given to her because of Jesus, right? that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So we see that it's only because of the, the works of the saints and the saints being made righteous by Christ to make any of that possible is what makes the bride of Christ. So back to our verse from Revelation 4.1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking to with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show things that must be hereafter. Again, I've already said it multiple times, but hereafter what? After the events of Revelation 2 and 3. 
what was in the Revelation 2 and 3? The return of Christ for the church to either take them or leave them behind. The rapture has already happened, and everything from here forward is in the things that are yet to be. Okay? So God says, let's see the things that will happen hereafter. Now, the word hereafter is translated the things that must take place after this in the um, English Standard Version. The things that must happen after this in the Good News Bible. The things that happen after, again, the events of Revelation 2 and 3. So the, so the rapture has happened, but not the second coming. All right. And so far, we see everything written in chronological order. So then we finally, good news, we're finally to verse 2. So we see verse 2, and we go a little quicker here. Um, it says, and immediately, so when, when God called him, said, hey, come up here. Guess what? How long did it take him to be up there? In the twinkling of an eye. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So he immediately changes from his body on Patmos to spirit in heaven and was before a throne. And again, there was a transition. This is not just a vision. He had a vision earlier, right? But now he's up in heaven seeing things. So from here, we're going to see the spiritual adventure that John takes, right? Before the throne of God. And the best way that I can understand this is John actually went to the time of the rapture. He actually experiences the events that we will experience. And in a way of thinking, I'm not saying this is exactly what will happen. Imagine that when the rapture comes, you might see John taking notes, if that makes sense. Okay. And think about it. Is that too hard for God? He's the one that declares tomorrow from yesterday, right? He knows the end from the beginning. Well, <laughs> back to the future, right? Maybe he has a DeLorean when he gets there. I don't know. No. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So now we're going to get to verse three. He says, and he that sat, so we're talking about this throne, this throne of God, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So Jasper, there's a vibe. Now, the problem with all of the crystals and the stones and the things we see here, um, when it comes to the stones in the Bible, the definition of stones changes a lot. OK, so what I might have said an emerald today, we're all like, oh, that's a green gemstone. Right. But emerald may have meant something totally different. 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, whatever. So we're not 100% sure on these stones because it's been lost. But jasper today is often purple or it's crystal clear. And the sardine stone or sardius stone is a red or glassy kind of reddish rock, all right? And it shows your symbolism of a purple, which is a royal color, right? The, the color of the kings. They would wear purple robes. They even mocked Jesus with a purple robe, right? And the sardine stone, a, gla a glass that was stained red, right? It sees a royal king stained with blood. So Jesus, again, was our sacrificial limb, but he was also our king. And he took away the sin of the world. And then there's this green rainbow or green halo around the throne. Looks like an emerald. Now, if we remember what a bow is to God, it's a covenant. It's a promise, right? And God is not one to break his promises. When he gives you a prophecy, he intends to keep it. When he gives you a promise, he intends to keep it. So what's interesting about it, the jasper, if we look back to the Old Testament, the high priest had to wear these 12 stones on their chest, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. So does anyone want to guess which tribe? Uh, if everybody says Judah, you're wrong. But which tribe does the jasper represent? Anyone want to guess? All right. Leave out a good guess. Good guess. It was actually Benjamin. Okay. <laughs> Benjamin. Everybody thought that, right? Sardis was the symbol of anyone want to guess this one? What about Sardis, the sardine stone? Anyone want to guess what that one is? Nope. Good try again. I like that you're trying. That's good. So it was Benjamin and it was Reuben. The sardine stone was Reuben. So these stones that represent the one who sits on the throne goes from the first to the last, right? Or you may say it, the Alpha and the Omega, at least of the tribes of Israel, right? From the youngest, Benjamin, to the oldest, Reuben, right? You see that? So again, Reuben, all right? Now, again, 
the symbol of Reuben comes first and the symbol of, sorry, the symbol of Benjamin comes first and the symbol of Reuben comes last. Do you see kind of how the first was last and the last was first? There's all kinds of imagery here. You can play around with this for a while if you want to read all that. Um, but again, we know that Jesus is the last Adam, right? He's the one that spiritually gives us birth, just like the first Adam physically gave us birth, right? Um, you know, it's interesting also that Reuben, do you know what his name means? It means behold a man, right? Hey, look, everybody, it's a man. Does anybody know what Benjamin means or Benjamin? It's the, son right the son of my right hand, the son of my power, the son of my strength, right? So the man, Jesus Christ, where was he seated? At the right hand of God, right? He was raised above all names. And now I'll give you a second try, third try. What does the emerald represent? That's across the back of the... Uh, of the throne okay it's a halo around the throne judah who said it who said judah very good Teresa. the emerald is this is the symbol of judah right representing what that jesus is the lion of the tribe of judah and you're like well wait a minute this isn't jesus's stone it's god's throne oh wait i repeat myself right <laughs> um so the symbolism goes on and on but again we can leave it there for now so we now look at verse four and um, I'm going to read verse four, and then we will take a just a five minute break, and then we'll uh, read verse four again to begin our next section. It says, and around about the throne were four and twenty seats. Here we are finally to the twenty four elders. Mm -hmm. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. I hope whenever we come back. We are going to come to a definite conclusion as to who these 24 elders represent. Now, not everybody agrees on this. And if you come to a different conclusion, that's okay. But that's our plan when we come back. So let's go ahead and take a break. <laughs> 